it was the worst experience of Groundhog Day that I, I can personally remember. It was April 1st, early in the morning, right in the midst of the pandemic and the quarantine, when the first fire broke out at Broadmoor United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. The scout hut, located near the sanctuary, was intentionally set on fire. And in less than 48 hours, another overnight fire. All right, Ashley, at 7.32 now, we're following some breaking news for you this morning. For the second time this week, Baton Rouge firefighters are on the scene of a fire at the Broadmoor United Methodist Church. That's where we find our Courtney Williams live this morning. And this Courtney, time, it was the office was located near the sanctuary. Fortunately, the sanctuary itself was not harmed. Our guest today is the Reverend Donnie Wilkinson, one of the pastors at Broadmoor United Methodist Church. We catch up to see how the church is doing, where he sees Christ most at work in the midst of everything that is happening, and how he is doing. We began our conversation by looking back at the moment his phone rang for the first time that the church was on fire. I was in my bed sound asleep. Uh, the phone rang. Uh, it was Eddie Maines, who, was our, who is our contemporary worship leader telling me that uh, he had just got a phone call that the church was on fire, the scout hut was on fire. Uh, so immediately put on some clothes, jumped in the car, drove up there. By the time I got to the church, uh, the firefighters had already extinguished the fire, but it was a com complete loss. Uh, the scout hut, uh, the troop there, over 100 Eagle Scouts have have come out of that troop. And in about 30 minutes, all of their equipment, all of their paraphernalia, all of the awards that they had collected at different uh, jamborees and gatherings through the years uh, reduced to a heap of ashes. And it was just profoundly sad. Very early on, it, it became apparent that this was probably not an accident, that it was the work of an arsonist. And just try to figure out why would somebody act out in like this way? Why would somebody vent their anger at the church or the world or whatever uh, in such a destructive way? It was just really profoundly sad. After a, an hour and a half, two hours up there, talking with the fire investigators, talking to the, to the firemen, made my way back home. I uh, took a quick shower because I smelled like smoke, <laughs> laid into the, got in the bed around 3.30. And I think I laid there for about 30 minutes before and I said, well, this is dumb. You're up already. <laughs> and got up and uh, started my, my morning like I normally do, which is doing the daily office and centering prayer, just beginning to, to begin to process this awful thing uh, in the presence and with the help of God. Donnie, I remember speaking to you the the morning after. You seemed to indicate that this was, as you indicated just now, the, the, the work of one person and that perhaps all was going to be well. I mean, obviously the, the loss of the scout hut. To get a call on that next night or the, the, the morning after the next morning within 48 hours that there has been yet another fire that must have been even more devastating it, it was it was the, the worst experience of groundhog day that i i can personally remember this time it was around uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock, when Tom Cook, one of our associate pastors, called and let me know that, that this time it was the administration building, the, the place where my office, where all the pastor's offices are, was uh, on fire and it was bad. He, he was on his way up there. He had not seen it for himself then at that point, but he said it, from what they told him, it was bad get in the car, start heading up there. Remember praying somewhere on airline highway between my house and as I was heading up to the church, uh, saying, God, this is, uh, it's hard to believe this is happening, but I, I know you 
or a God who brings beauty out of ashes. And so let this in the way that can only be done by your providence be, be used uh, for your glory uh, in some way. Getting up to the church, uh, seeing, seeing, I think it was six uh, trucks there, all of them pouring water into the, into the fire. Uh, the roof had already collapsed on my office. I could see in there, I could see my desk charred, uh, backlit by the flames. Again, kind of disbelief, but in, uh, in a strange way, knowing even then that it's going to be okay. That, that line from Joy, Joy of Norwich, all shall be well and all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. I remember that coming to mind uh, there, standing, uh, watching the, you know, the, the roof fall in and the flames shooting up into the sky, knowing that uh, it's awful, but that we're not alone, that God is with us and that it, it'll be okay and that God will find some way to redeem this because that's the business that God is in, is redeeming all the awful things of the world. Donnie, I can't help but think about the fact that uh, this was your office. It's yeah. where so much pastoral care has taken place, not only with you and your time at Broadmoor, but with so many different pastors over the years. There's something awfully personal uh, about the office going up in flames. Yeah, it it, it was, and I'll be be real honest with you now. I, uh, I I'm pretty sure I have not yet fully processed uh, the emotional uh, impact of this yet. Uh, as I began to think about some of the things that. I lost. Uh, I'm not a, an overly sentimental person. Uh, I'm pretty quick to throw things away, but thinking about the, uh, the stole that uh, I was given at ordination, uh, the, the framed uh, illumined manuscript that April brought back to me from Assisi when she went to Italy uh, when we were first dating with St. Francis Prayer on it. And it, it, it's doubly sad for me in this way that uh, 20 years ago, uh, let's see, so 22 years ago now, I wasn't the pastor visiting that office. I was a, uh, a seeking young man discerning a call to ministry. And I went in and made an appointment with Chuck Simmons uh, and sat in that very office and told him what God was doing in my life and remembering him getting this catheter, the canary grin on his face and saying, Donnie, it sounds like you're being called to ministry, but you'll never know until you take the next step. Never thinking that 20 years later, I would be sitting behind the desk that he was sitting behind, the das desk that is now uh, a heap of charred wood. Donnie, I, we say this all the time. Uh, we casually throw out the phrase, how are you? Um, in fact, when I reached out to you to, to record this podcast, I said, how are you? <laughs> um, how are you? How, how is Donnie right now? Um, I, I, I'm doing good. A and I say that not uh, out of just the practice way of deflecting anything, any emotion, you know, vulnerability or, or being transparent. I, I really am good. I have, an, I've been supported in such an incredible way uh, by, by friends and colleagues from around the state calling and checking on me. Uh, the members of the congregation have been incredibly supportive. My family has, has uh, understood and has done incredible for me. And uh, I, I'm, I, I'm good, I believe, in part because, you know, in, in John, Jesus talks about uh, those who believe in me will have a, 
a, a, a spring of, of water, of life-giving water flowing up from within them. And uh, I, I no longer wonder about what that metaphor might mean. I, I know what he's talking about there. Over and over again, over the past several weeks, I have experienced uh, the presence of, of Christ's Spirit renewing, refreshing, empowering me uh, uh, in this time of, of loss and, uh, and, and inspiring new dreams of, of what can be be uh, in the future at, at Broadmoor. And so how am I doing? I, I'm, I'm sad, I'm angry, but I'm good. And now I guess the follow-up question should be, how is the church doing? Um, whenever there's a tragedy uh, or a loss, I'm thinking of funerals or, or some of the first things that come to mind, a significant event, if you will, the family wants and in some ways needs to get together to share, grieve, even laugh. Yet here we are with these shelter in place orders. How have you been able to cope with that? How has the church been able to cope with that? Yeah, it, it's it, it's been very, it was very challenging those first few days. Um, people wanting to come by and see to see for themselves. You know, there's something about making a pilgrimage to a place and to see for, with your own eyes, what you've heard people talk about or you've seen a picture of. I remember uh, that day, that the day of the fire, about three o'clock in the afternoon, I was up at the church and uh, a, a member of the congregation who's in her late 80s, early 90s, drove up with just tears in her eyes and she said, I just had to see it for myself. I, I could not believe it until I saw it for myself. And, uh, you know, and in that moment, in that moment, you want to, you want to reach out and you want to make a connection with somebody and you want to give them, uh, give them a hug. Uh, instead, uh, she and I fist bumped and that served uh, in the place uh, of that. But we just stood there and, and looked at it together for a while. And nothing really needed to be said. We we're just experiencing that loss and witnessing it together. Uh, for the first few days, there, were, there was a constant stream of people wanting to come up. And so we had myself or Ken and Pickett or Tom Cook, the other pastors, on hand, just being up there, just being available. So if somebody wanted or somebody needed to talk, they would have somebody to, to talk to. And then it was it was beautiful. We we, we found a way to uh, to make the very best of this awful situation on Holy Saturday. For Good Friday, we went and uh, I gave the little homily standing right in front of the charred remains of the administration building. And Eddie Mains, our, our, our cameraman and musician extraordinaire, we had worked out. So as I began talking with that in the background, and then we, we walked around the, uh, the courtyard there and wound up in front of the cross that we use every Easter to to flower the cross, a symbol of the resurrection. And uh, I put a rose up on that cross and then we invited the members of the congregation to come up on Holy Saturday to bring flowers uh, and to stand for a moment, to have a moment in that courtyard close to the rubble, close to the devastation, and, and to put the flowers up as an act of defiance uh, in the face of this destruction, an act of creating beauty out of the ashes. And, uh, you know, a hundred, a hundred or more members of the congregation came up that day. And it was a very cathartic moment for many people. There were a lot of tears shed and a lot of long distance hugs 
people uh, kind of reaching out and kind of air embracing each other without without violating the social distancing orders. But to you know to be with people, to be with each other, to grieve, and then to uh, together build something beautiful out of the ashes uh, was was a powerful moment both for me and for the congregation. We are back with our conversation with Donnie in just a moment. More on a ministry at Broadmoor that is providing him and the entire church a refreshing reminder of how God is calling them to provide. All of that in just a moment, but first a word from our sponsor, the United Methodist Foundation of Louisiana, and they are up to something big. With the quarantine in place and an unknown end date, churches and pastors are having to rise to the occasion and get creative with ministry. For some, it may mean broadcasting worship services online, Bible studies over the internet, but all of these unique ideas, they cost money. And that's where your foundation comes in. Your foundation has set aside $100,000 to award to churches and ministries within the Louisiana Annual Conference to help fund creative ministry ideas. Now, this idea must support evangelism, mission, and or outreach during this unprecedented time. And they are encouraging all of us to use our imagination and our hearts. If you have questions, need to read the nitty gritty details, you can head to their website, umf.org, more specifically, umf.org slash unique. Back now to our conversation with Donnie. Red Stick Together, a feeding ministry at Broadmoor that began to take shape prior to COVID-19, it is now thriving. I asked Donnie just how much that ministry is providing the community and, quite frankly, the church itself. Yeah, it's, it's really been incredible. And uh, we owe a big, big debt of gratitude to Elaine Burley, the head of the Mitchell Outreach and Engagement Office. Uh, a grant that we got through her office allowed us to, just the same week that the shutdown happened, and we began to all realize the the implications of this and the beginning of people not being able to have make uh, go to ju- go to work to earn money to buy food for their families we were able to expand from from one night a week on Wednesdays to three nights a week and increase the amount that we are doing from serving a hundred or so people to to now over 200 people a, a week as of la- last week as of last count over a thousand people over the last a uh, couple of weeks ha- have come through. And, you know, due to the, the nature of it right now, we're not able to to really connect with people and to hear their stories as much as we would like to. But it's a, it's a sign of hope for the congregation. Monday evening, I was up there. And uh, this gentleman came up and uh, he, he said, man, why are y'all doing this? Uh, what, t- just tell me, what, what do y'all want? He said, well, man, we don't want anything. We just want you to know that God loves you, that uh, we're here for you, and that together we can make make it through this difficult time. He goes, man, that's awesome. That's awesome. A few minutes later, he and, uh, he and another person came back, and he said, uh, hey, I went, went home and... Uh, and there are some more people at our house. Could we get some more food uh, to feed the rest of the people at home? Absolutely. Here you go. This man, it, it means so much. Y'all are feeding my whole family tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say, man, it, it, that's that's what that's what it is to follow to follow Christ. This is the what God desires for us to share our food with the hungry. And. Uh, it's been very, very rewarding and very humbling to see what God has been able to do through through this ministry over these last few weeks. Donnie, give us a good word in the midst of this Easter season and everything that Broadmoor has gone through, everything you've gone through 
Give us a good word. I, I remember the very last words that John Wesley is reported to have said from his deathbed. Best of all, God is with us. God is with us. In this time of profound upheaval, God is with us. In this time of the fires at our church, God is with us. In the uncertainty of the future, God is with us. For he is Emmanuel, and we're not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. The Reverend Donnie Wilkinson, Broadmoor United Methodist Church here in Baton Rouge. We thank you for your time. Thank you, Todd. Donnie tells us fire investigators have a person of interest they are keeping tabs on as they continue to process evidence. Meanwhile, there are numerous ways for you to help Broadmoor Methodist. You can do so by visiting their website, broadmoormethodist.org slash giving. It gives you the opportunity to support either the fire recovery or Red Stick together. We'll have a link in the show notes of this podcast. For Mary Burley, our show producer, the United Methodist Foundation, our sponsor, I'm your host, Todd Rossnagel. May the grace of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and the tomorrow after that. Thanks for joining us, everyone.